Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Dan. Title slide. Do I have to say stuff again? Oh. <laughs> I want to tell you about SETI, uh, SETI at Home and Distributed Computing. I'm stealing the credit for these people. They do all the work. Uh, I just get the credit. Um, and uh, Jim Gray gives us a lot of advice. Um, I want to start by giving you a history of SETI. These are early ideas for how to get in touch with extraterrestrials, is that you build large geometric structures uh, on the planet. Uh, um, oh, thank you. The laser pointer is the bottom one. So uh, you make a right triangle of pine trees, uh, maybe three, four, five miles on a side, big squares of wheat, dirt, and water. This was suggested a couple hundred years ago. And then ET would look down with the high-resolution telescopes and see that we knew about the Pythagorean theorem. Uh, unfortunately, it was not funded. It was <laughs> then uh, von Littron suggested that we dig a big circular ditch 20 miles in across, fill it with kerosene, and use this match not to scale, make a bright <laughs> ring of light. And then ET would see this uh, circle and uh, met with a similar fate. And then. Uh, Charles Crow suggested that we get in touch with the Martians by reflecting sunlight to the Martians and actually have several mirrors, one where he lived and outlined the shape of the Big Dipper. And I think you can guess what happened with that. The, the first funded project was to send pornography into space. This was the, uh, the Pioneer 10 spacecraft. And there was a lot of argument about what these people, they were originally holding hands. And then they said, oh, ET, you think it's one creature. And some of the lines were removed down here. And, these are directions of, so they can find us and come and eat us. This is the solar system with the sun, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and you can see the path of the spacecraft. Um, and so that was the first funded SETI project. Um, so then the, the theorists came along and said, well, you don't have to go looking for ET. You can calculate the number of civilizations in the galaxy, and all you have to do is multiply these parameters together. The problem with the theoretical approach is that we have no idea what any of these parameters are. Uh, uh, it goes, it's kind of a whittling down process. You start with the number of stars and how many of those stars have planets and how many of the planets have the right conditions, the right chemicals, the right temperatures. And then if you have a good planet, uh, do you get life to start and do you get intelligence evolving? Do you get communication technology? And the last factor is the longevity of the civilization. Do they blow themselves up as soon as they discover radio and lasers or do they live for billions of years? Um, so you multiply all those factors together. I'll tell you a little bit about some of the factors. We're just beginning to learn about planets around other stars. Um, and we can only find uh, really big planets, jupiter size, saturn size. We can't find the little dinky ones. But in a few years from space, hopefully we'll be able to see if there's little rocky planets like Earth out there. Um, we think we are beginning to understand how life got started in something like this, the primordial soup. And uh, then uh, people have done these experiments where you, you take a flask and you put in the early constituents of the Earth's atmosphere, methane, ammonia, water, hydrogen, and you fake put in sparks, fake lightning, and you don't get gorillas crawling out of this thing, but you do get the basic building blocks of life, amino acids and things like that. So we're beginning to understand this process, and it, it happened on Earth very quickly. The oldest rocks you can find have uh, microfossils. So the fact that it happened quickly on Earth gives us some kind of warm feeling that maybe the universe is teeming with life. So we don't know for sure, but the Earth... So how are we going to find other civilizations if they're out there? The one way is maybe they're sending radio waves. And on Earth, uh, we've been polluting uh, outer space with radio signals for the last 65 years. This is a plot of television power leaving the Earth, 1940, 1950. 19 We're growing exponentially. The Earth is brighter than the sun at television frequencies. We have military radar. We have FM radio, navigational beacons, all going out, traveling at the speed of light. I Love Lucy has gone past 10,000 uh, 10, stars. The nearby stars have seen The Simpsons. So, <laughs> so we've even sent messages intentionally. Uh, this is a, a message that left the Earth um, about 20 years ago. It consists of 1,679 bits. Uh, and ET is supposed to count up the bits and say, oh, 1,679 is a product of two prime numbers, 23 by 73. Therefore, it must be a two-dimensional image that's 23 by 73 down. And and then you reconstruct that image, and you see the solar system with 
the sun and Mercury, Venus, Earth tip toward the person, the height of the person, DNA, a radio telescope, amino acids, binary number. Everybody see all that? So, um, but ET will have a little longer to figure out what it all means. So, so there are a couple of different kinds of signals you could look for. One would be a deliberate signal that's intentionally sent to us. That would be really spectacular. You know, mine contain their whole Library of Congress, all their music, poetry, um, science, medicine. Maybe they've been talking to other civilizations for a billion years, and they'll tell us how to get it on the galactic internet. Um, another might be an artifact, uh, just kind of a leakage signal um, that's not really meant for us, just like our television leaves off their planet. Um, and we probably won't be able to decode that. Versus if they send us a deliberate signal, they probably make it easy to decode with lots of pictures and language lessons and so on, and we could learn a lot. Um, so at Berkeley, we have, um, we're not the only people doing SETI. There are several groups. This is an international effort. At Berkeley, we have six different projects looking for radio signals, laser signals, looking in the infrared. And I'm just going to tell you about a few of our projects. So um, in the radio, we use these big radio telescopes. This is 300 feet across. Here's a full-size jogger. Um, and while we were using this telescope, this is what happened. And you might ask, how did that happen? And the answer is here. Um, that the aliens did not want to be discovered. And so they zapped the, they zapped the telescope. Um, and uh, actually, the zap theory may be correct, because this is another telescope that we were using. And this is what happened to that telescope. And so we're testing this zap theory at this telescope. Uh, which, and the, uh, so the, this telescope is um, the Arecibo telescope in Puerto Rico that David was talking about. It's um, 300 meters, 1,000 feet across. It holds 10 billion bowls of cornflakes. It's the world's largest telescope. And uh, we have our own receiver up at the focus um, that we use while the other astronomers are using the telescope. We call it piggyback SETI. We go along for a ride at the same time. I should explain that most astronomers, if you're lucky, you get a day or two a year to use this thing. But because we've figured out a way to use it at the same time, we can use it all year round. So we're collecting data 24 hours. As we speak, we're collecting data. So we have a lot of data. We have hundreds of terabytes of data coming from this thing. So. Um, one way to analyze it is to build a big supercomputer. This is a, basically a big spectrometer. And basically, it looks at, the, um, at all these different frequencies. There's channel number 2,064,001. Here's another channel, 2,064,000. And we just look for a strong signal at one of those frequencies, just a big spectrometer. It's uh, 168 million channels every second we look through. And we just look for a strong signal. So that's the kind of simple way to do it, just to build a bunch of hardware to do that. Um, and we've been doing that. And this is kind of a summary of our data, 30 trillion fruitless tries, but scientists keep searching. And actually, now we're up to 10 to the 18 fruitless tries. So we wanted to try something new. We want to look for new kinds of patterns, drifting signals. This is uh, frequency and time. We're going to look for pulsing signals. Uh, it's hard for your eye to see that. Um, so uh, we launched this um, SETI at Home project, um, which I think a lot of you are familiar with, um, where uh, in order to look for the, uh, a, a a much richer variety of signals. We need a lot of computing power. So we ask the public for help. And uh, the way it works is you, you go to our website, you download this SETI at home screensaver. And um, when you do that, you get uh, assigned a, a work unit, a little piece of sky that was recorded at the Arecibo telescope. Um, just a couple hundred kilobytes. Uh, everybody gets about 100 seconds of data. And um, you put in your name. And then it goes through this data. It takes several days to go through that piece of uh, work that you've been assigned. And uh, then when it's done, a little message pops up on the screen saying, am I done? It'll send the results back to our server at Berkeley. And it sent, the results will be strong signals that it found. Here it's found a little Gaussian. It finds different kinds of signals. It sends the strong ones back to us. And then your name is attached to the data. So if you're the lucky one that finds that faint murmur from distant civilization, you get the Nobel Prize. Um, but you have to share the Nobel Prize with a lot of people. There's 5 million people who are running say at home. Nobel Prize is about a million dollars, so you get about 20 cents. So you won't get rich, but you might get famous. Um, 2,000 people a day continue to sign up for this project. Um, they donate about 1,000 years of CPU time every day. Um, so far, they've donated a couple million years of CPU time. Um, it's the largest computation that's ever been done. Actually, now we're about 85 teraflops. It's the biggest supercomputer on the planet, although it's very low latency, but a lot of, a lot of computing power. Um, and uh, if you want, you can participate in SETI at Home as an individual. This is optional, but a couple hundred thousand people send in information about themselves. I'm an artist living in San Francisco. I paint murals, blah, blah, blah. 
Um, you can also join a team. There's 60,000 teams, primary, secondary, junior colleges, uh, universities, small, medium, large size companies. And this uh, teams kind of compete with each other. Here's Compact Sun, SGI, IBM, Microsoft is number five. Sorry about that, guys. And uh, here's Microsoft has donated 2,000 years. And this competition has led to some strange behavior. Um, you can um, buy work units on eBay um, so that um, this guy has, has done a lot of computation, has analyzed 7,000 work units, and uh, a unique chance to join the elite top 0.18%. He'll transfer your work, his work units over to your account so that you will sort of bubble up near the top of the list of, of set at home users. Uh, and this went for $275. Um, another weird phenomenon is that um, there are these um, people that build SETI farms. If you go to setifarm.org, you can find a bunch of guys like look as nerdy as this, and they built these big clusters in their basement. Here's another one. Just to crank, crank out SETI at home work units and sort of this competition has led to some interesting stuff. The website gets a couple hundred thousand visitors a day, two million hits a day. Uh, one of the things we're excited about is a lot of kids are running this thing, um, and, uh, and people are using it in schools. There's a curriculum about messages in space. It's a great way to get kids interested in science um, because it touches on this question, of are we alone, touches on chemistry and evolution and astronomy and physics. And there's a lot of interesting questions that, the, that you can bring up um, by talking about life in the universe. So one of the things we're looking for with Jim's help is to look for these interesting candidates. So here's a little place on the sky. And the telescope went through it. Uh, a few different times, maybe six months later, a year later, and each time we saw an interesting signal. That's what gets our attention, the kind of same kind of signal, roughly the same frequency, at roughly the same place on the sky. And we have a few terabytes of, of data that we took out of the few hundred ter terabytes of these interesting signals, and that's kind of what we're doing, um, looking for these interesting signals, and we go back to the telescope and see if they really happen. I wish I could tell you that, oops, uh, I wish I could tell you that was ET, but it's, um, it's not. It's probably some kind of interference. It's um, radio pollution is getting to be a nasty problem. So one of the things that developed out of SETI at home was a kind of general purpose infrastructure for doing public participation computing. This is uh, led by my colleague David Anderson with uh, National Science Foundation funding. And it's open source code for for anybody that wants to do distributed computing the way SETI Home is done. And um, a lot of people are now using this uh, Boink, Boink is Berkeley Open Infrastructure for Network Computing. There's a bunch of astronomy projects. There's a climate prediction project. That's one of my favorite projects um, that you can participate in. There are a lot of medicine projects. And you can allocate now. You can sign up for these different projects if you want. You can allocate how you want your PC to be used. You can say, I want 20% of my spare computing cycles to be going for SETI and 10% for climate modeling. And there's a scary paper that came out of this in Nature a couple months ago about the different scenarios that, of global warming. Because they had so much computing power, 100,000 people signed up, they were able to do statistics about kind of worst case scenarios, best case scenarios, and, and what's going to happen. Um, so here's the new SETI home screensaver that runs under Boink. Here's the climate prediction project. This is a gravity wave project. Anyway, you can go to the Boink website and look at these different projects at different universities. And we're just um, helping to provide the infrastructure so that you don't have to be a computer scientist to do public participation. Uh, you can use this kind of edge resource aggregation to, if, you're, if you can kind of democratize computing, if your project is appealing to the public, you can get a lot of computing power. Um, where is computing power? We expect in a few years there'll be a billion machines on the internet, um, most of them in, in homes. And uh, if you could harness 10% of that, you get 100 petaf petaflops. And you also get an exabyte of storage. We're working on distributed storage. Um, and uh, we haven't done that yet, but there's a lot of storage out there, as well as a lot of computing par power, if you could harness it and get people interested in your science. Um, so let me tell you about some of the new things we're working on. Um, we're working on uh, uh, building a big telescope array with these high bandwidth feeds. Um, this is called the Allen Telescope Array, named after Paul Allen, who co-founded Microsoft. And it's, uh, um, it's uh, instead of building big dishes, this thing is uh, made out of lots and lots of little dishes, a few hundred of these 20-foot dishes. And it's a lot cheaper, and you can do more interesting science. Uh, it's fault tolerant. 
And we think it's the way that big telescopes will be built in the future out of lots of little telescopes. The reason that nobody's done this before is because it needs a lot of computing power. The computing power you need goes up as the square of the number of dishes. And, but it's actually a lot cheaper. The steel is a lot cheaper. You can stamp them out like hot tubs. Um, but the computing power grows. We think it's going to lead to this thing called the square kilometer ray, which is a billion dollar thing. A lot of different people have different ideas how to build it. So I mentioned this computing power grows as the square. So we need a few hundred petaops to keep up with this data. So out of these hundreds of, of dishes, uh, each dish supplies a few hundred gigabits. So uh, it's a few hundred terabits of data and aggregate bandwidth. We can't actually keep up with it in the beginning. We're going to build a back end that only can keep up with a few percent of the data, but we hope with Moore's law we'll eventually be able to, to work on um, a, a, a few hundred terabits of data. One of the things we're working on are these uh, high-speed digitizers. This thing digitizes at a couple of gigabits, a couple of gigasamples per second. It sports its data out over InfiniBand or 10 gigabit Ethernet. And we're working on these high-performance FPGA supercomputers to analyze radio telescope data. But I think it might be interesting to the to people here who are trying to do very uh, large supercomputing projects. If you can do integer arithmetic, these boards are filled with FPGAs, not CPUs. Uh, and each board has um, 20, 40 gigabytes of data. And most importantly, it's got a very high speed I.O. It's got 18, 10 gigabit connectors on it. So you can do 180 gigabits in, 180 gigabits out. And each board can do about a, a tera op per second. But it's integer ops. Um, and so this is what a board looks like. It's got a bunch of FPGAs. Each FPGA's got a bunch of DRAM. FPGAs are about 100 times more powerful than CPUs. Um, and they're much lower power as well. So if you can do integer ops and you can do, your algorithm is pretty simple. The reason that nobody's done this thing, we're, we build these uh, clusters of these things. Uh, you connect them together with InfiniBand switches. Um, the reason that people don't do this typically is because they're hard to program. But we're working on tools. A lot of people are coming up with C compilers, uh, MATLAB Simulink. We're working on tools that kind of abstract the hardware away that auto partition so you don't have to worry about what chip does which, at what board does what. Um, so the tools are getting better. And, and the FPGAs are growing much faster than CPUs because um, it, the, on FPGAs, it's just a very regular array of multipliers and adders and things like that. So it's really easy to compress in the new technology. The first people that will adopt the 65 nanometer technology will be Xilinx and Altera. And it, um, so the Moore's Law is on a much steeper curve. It's actually three times improvement in computing uh, per year. So we think this is a good way to go if you have simple algorithms um, and, uh, and can do integer ops, eventually do floating point ops. So this is kind of the summary of where SETI projects are. Um, so e all these different projects are plotted here as a function of how much of the parameter space they've covered, how much of the sky they've covered, how much frequency they've covered, how, much, how sensitive they are. But the big thing I want you to notice is that there's a lot of uncovered territory out here. Earthlings are just getting in the game. We're just learning how to do this. Uh, we, today, we'd be extremely lucky to find ET radio signals or laser signals if they're out there. Um, and, but I'm actually optimistic in the long run. If you look at the progress of our groups or other groups, we started with 100 channels, then we had 65, then we have 4 million, we have 168 billion, now we have 5 billion channels. And the, the capabilities are doubling every year. So even though right now I think uh, we're just scratching the surface, I think in the long run, um, if you kind of hope if this trend continues, we'll eventually be able to analyze 128,000 terahertz, a million beams on the sky. And so don't hold your breath, but maybe in our lifetimes, Earthlings will have a chance of, of finding ET if they're out there. I wanted to warn you that if you're thinking about um, giving up your, your area and joining our group and looking for ET, that this can be a dangerous field. This guy was burned at the stake. Um, and I wanted to end with a a couple of haikus about SETI. So if you participate in SETI Home, you can loan your uh, computer. But also, a lot of people want to do other things. They write literature. They send stuff. They send us poetry. They send us um, paintings. And there's all kinds of stuff, music on the website. You can, and there's 50,000 haikus that people have sent us. I'm not going to read you 50,000 haikus. Um, you can go to the website. But I'll just read you two. Um, Paula Cook at Duke University, Searching for Life. Answers are revealed about ourselves. And uh, Dan Seidner, one million earthlings, bounded by optimism, leave their PCs on. 
Um, thank you very much. So I'm the only thing between you and lunch, but I think we have time for a couple of questions. Dan? Yeah. Uh, so how are we managing data integrity? Um, so we find that if you have a million PCs out there, um, they make mistakes. And some people turn up their clock rate uh, just because, and they don't know that their floating point thing makes mistakes. It looks OK. And um, there's little bit flips, cosmic rays. And then there are deliberate cheaters that try to get work uh, for stuff they haven't done, you know, that send you results that are flaky. And so um, the only way we've been able to figure out how to really make sure that everything's OK is do redundant computing. So we'll, if we get a, uh, so we will send a piece of work out to two people, uh, especially if it's suspicious, and compare the results. So just, just pairs. You can do it with pairs, and then if you get suspicious, send it out to a third person and then vote. It's actually quite a lot of errors. And we have a lot of interesting statistics about which machines make more errors than others and that kind of stuff. But we haven't really analyzed that. Um, no, but there, we could make it public if somebody's interested. And the other part that you guys told us one time is also the whole social computing aspect of it with the people cheating and everyone trying to game their way up into the thing. And that's actually it'd be interesting for other folks to look at it from that perspective. Yeah, we haven't really studied that. But um, so um, we have the world's largest supercomputer, but we're only using about half the rate because we're sending out these, we're doing this redundant supercomputing. And I think that's the only way we could really figure out how to, how to make sure that our data is reliable. Yeah, Steve. And how many of the discovered So how many planets have been found so far? Yeah, um, we've, there are 150 extrasolar planets beyond the 9 or 10 in our solar system that have been found so far. That's recent. You, if you had asked me 10 years ago, as you know, Steve, um, though I, wouldn't, I would have thought there are planets, but I wouldn't know for sure. But it looks like a lot of stars have planets going around them. Um, so we've looked at about two-thirds of those. Some of them are in the southern hemisphere, and most of our work is done in the north, so we can't get to those. Um, and... Uh, haven't found anything. So, but we're just getting in the game. Okay. Great. Thank you.